I tell single people, marry a Christian and be careful who you get in the church of Christ. Because everybody wet is not saved. <laughs> don't mean nothing, brother. Doesn't mean nothing. Just because you got wet, you know, doesn't mean you're a disciple. You can be baptized without being a disciple. I was talking to some of the brothers about this uh, earlier today. It hit me like a ton of bricks after walking around thinking I was doing a good work. I mean, you know, in 10 years, we baptized over 850 people in New York City where I preach at. That's a lot of people in 10 years. It may not even been 10 years. It might have been less than 10 years. 850 people. But I couldn't find a quarter of them. And, and I discovered something, that there's a difference between a baptism and a convert. Amen. Because they got baptized doesn't mean you ended up with a disciple, with a learner, a follower. I hear an amen. amen. By the way, that's pretty much the retention problem. I had a guy uh, that uh, you, couldn't walk in, you couldn't walk in a room and not walk out and, and not get baptized with this guy. No, I'm serious. A am I kidding, Donald? No, no, this guy, first of all, let me tell you, he knew the Bible, knew it through and through, but he had masterful salesman skills, and he would tie you up in what's called a horn of dilemma. You didn't have anywhere to go, except to the war, sincerely. A lot of times people would get baptized because they couldn't answer him. You understand? Not because they were convicted. But to save face, I, 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 they were cornered. That's not a disciple. And I'm not making an indictment against him that he did his job. But I have to have some discernment. I would rather walk away from the Bible study and you go home and wrestle with what I've taught you then to pressure you up against the wall and say either we're going to the wall, if what I've taught you is true, explain to me why you would not obey it. In sales, that's called a closed-in question. Right? Would you like to have a Bible study with me Tuesday at 5 or Thursday at 6? That's a closed-in question. I only gave you two choices. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. In regard to the uh, the parable of the wheat and tears, when the kingdom of God is like you know, the farmer that had a garden, shouldn't I know that? To me, I look at that like there's going to be people in church that are really not disciples, but it's not up to me to take do the separating. Just keep them coming, teaching the word of God, and let God do the sorting out at the end. Isn't that what that says? You know what? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the fifth on that. Because okay. I haven't read the parable of the tears for a long time. I have an idea. It says that. But I want to tell you that understanding the Bible is about context, 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 context. In what context did he say that? The kingdom of God is like. I know what it says, but in what context is the kingdom of God being applied? You understand? This what I'm saying is, don't just read that parable. Uh, friends, let me give you. Let me let me give you a for instance. In Luke chapter 15, the Lord told three parables. The reason for His telling those three parables was to teach the Jews how God felt about the saved. It wasn't just about the parable of the prodigal son, or the other two parables told around the prodigal son. There was an ethereal intent for the Jesus telling those parables. And this is why I say context, context. More often than not, when Jesus started teaching parables, it was not an isolated parable. Something occurred or happened that prompted him to tell a parable to prove this point. Are you following me? So that's why I said he could be very right. I would need to go back and look at the context to find out why Jesus chose to tell that parable so that I can more align what he's really referring to when he talks about the kingdom. 
You see what I'm saying? Again, you may very well be right. I'm just saying that's what, that's what I would have to do uh, because I want to enjoy ethereal intent. And that stops me from going away, making a lot of applications that Jesus never intended to make. Here's one we do all the time, and I'll come to you in one second. Here's what we do all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40. The Bible says do all things decent and order, orderly. So we can only, you know, we, we, we've got to do all things decent and in order. Listen, what Paul meant when he said decent and orderly was one thing after another. And the context there was disruptive worship. Every man hath a psalm. Every man hath a doctrine. They were doing all of this stuff at the same time. And one could not understand the other. So his instruction was, do one at a time. Every time we don't like something in the church, we'll say, that's not decent and in order. Well, you, you're saying something the Lord never intended to say. Thank you for waiting, brother. Go ahead, please. please. You said something a minute ago about yourself. You said that you look back, you, you baptized 850 people over 10 years, or about that. I mean, you came back, you looked, you couldn't even find a quarter of them. Right, that's true, it's true. But remember, all we have to do is remember, what does it say about the seed? We plant the seed, and we water, but who brings it up? God does. So, it's not wrong, and that brother did that, it's not wrong. That's yeah. just the way he did it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think my ultimate point is that it's wrong, but I do think that we can be uninsightful and careless. I do think we can accept the responsibility for that. I understand that the grandeur of it all is at the end of the day, the gospel was taught. But for the love of Jesus, if I've got some poor kid sitting here trembling at the knees because he wants to be able to answer me and he can't answer me, I have a hard time associating that with something good. Yeah, I know what you're exactly saying, brother. You know, it's, it's not my style of teaching. It's not my style of teaching. And I'm not saying that he did anything wrong. I'm just saying, did we all do the most wise and sagacious thing? I'm sure we've done, we've all done everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I can speak to that. Like, a month ago, I had a conversation with a youth who came out eventually and said um, that the first time that they were baptized, they had not made that decision. But people through the study were like, well, you've come to realize this is true. And then they got out towels. They got out what they were supposed to wear. And the next thing she wow. knows, she's being baptized and was not ready for that. But now, years later, is, is afraid to have a conversation because she also hears people like, we don't need to be baptized again. And so she doesn't want to look stupid and say, well, I don't think my first one was good. Because there was this, this assumption of, you know, like, okay, let's do this before you change your mind. And now she's living a life thinking that, well, I don't really think that I've really committed myself to this. And she's, she's anxious because she doesn't feel great and she's not in good conscience with God. But yet she's at the same time scared to bring up conversation because of wow. all of this. And, wow. and so like that, that's, I, I get why it's, it's, it, it is hard and, and we don't want to rush. And, you know, I, oftentimes I'll end a conversation with... Um, when we're sitting down and they're not ready, then I, I mean, I, in the prayer before we go, I throw in there like, I want, I want this to be on your heart, and and God, I want them to or you to be on their mind, and I want them to be restless. I want them to, yes. to bring bring this back, <laughs> but I want I want them to come to to somebody. Amen. I don't I don't want to go on a fourth Amen. Let, let me let me tell you. Uh, I don't know if this is true or not, Donald, but I've listened to you here in Florida tell this story a couple of times. But let me give you a version of Donald's conversion that I haven't heard him tell. Let me give you another slant of it. Donald did not walk in off of the streets of New York City by himself. He brought a, it was another gentleman with him. There were two of them. Donald had come to New York to be an actor and a model. Is that true? No. And uh, this other guy was a professional musician and accomplished. And he and Don actually came to Harlem together. And I spotted them 
And I made a beeline, as I often did, to make people know that they are welcome at this place. Amen. If this is the house of God, you're welcome here and we're happy to see you. The two of them continue to come during a period of time that was the annual Northeast Lectureship. And our congregation hosts the regional Northeast Lectureship every year. Bible studies began, and after a period of time, both of them got baptized. Both Brother Ballard and the, is that true, Don? I thought Matt obeyed the gospel. They told me Matt obeyed the gospel. Matt disappeared. That's right. Donald stayed. Did he, did he, he went through the Bible studies with Ray, did he not? He did not. Well, I'm wrong, Don. I thought Matt got baptized. He came that first Sunday. Okay. Well, my Lord, I have to change that story. Change that story. And and I'm, but I'm glad I brought this up because that's always bothered me. And 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 you know what? Matt has come back to Harlem from time to time. And it always bothered me when he would come back from time to time. I'm going, we never really want him, but we want Don. They both heard the same gospel taught. The same seed was planted in their hearts. One guy obeys, the other guy doesn't. I thought he did, though. I thought he did, and he didn't stay. And the point I was getting ready to make is that you can often have two guys at the same time plant the same seed, and one will stay, and the other won't. Oh, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Um, but no, no pressure was put on Donald. There wasn't any pressure tactics and, and that kind of thing. I think Donald's heart was in the right place. And more than that, I think that Don had, uh, that God had some plans for Donald that Donald did not have for himself. He had no plans whatsoever <laughs> about being a preacher. I can tell you that. <laughs> And I've seen that happen on more than one occasion where God wanted one thing. People wanted something else. We have to know the difference <clears throat> between tradition and doctrine and what belongs to God and what belongs to man. I think we're going to see some turbulent times coming in the Church of Christ in, in, in the coming years. And I think a lot of it is going to be a reflection of the fact that we've stopped studying the Bible that we've opened the door for a lot of theological supposition, conjecture. We've tried to relegate the Bible to a book of subjectivity. What you see, you get out of it. What I see, I get out of it. And what it's going to lend to is a total environment of nonconformity, nonunity. Every man is going to do that which is right in his own mind. And we've been here before, and we've gotten in trouble with God before. Because every man has gone in the direction that he feels he's being led to go. No standards, you know, no, 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 no fundamentals, no basics. And I'll be honest with you, Brother Shabazz is fighting for that. I think that there are some fundamentals. I think there are some basics. I also believe that there are some other matters in which there ought to be some elasticity. You, you, you see? Where, where we ought to stop trying to dictate to people in matters of judgment as though they are matters of doctrine. I don't care whether you do the Lord's Supper first and contribution second, that kind of thing. That, who am I to dictate? You, you, you know, another congregation may do the order of services differently, but all five, five items of worship are done. Amen. I do not believe that mechanical instruments of music is a matter of judgment or a matter of opinion. And I understand that there are those who don't have any issue. You know what? That's the byproduct of the culture. You've been programmed now. You've lived in America long enough to be deprogrammed, to not allow things that used to bother you to bother you in the way it used to bother you. You know what? Let me, let me, it's in your face. Let me give it to you. Forty years ago, you would not see a naked woman's body on primetime television in America by definition, prime time is from 6 a.m. in the morning to 10.30 at night. 40 years ago, you would not see it. And I'm not going to debate it with you because 40 years ago, it was an FCC law. 
40 years ago, you would never turn on the radio and hear a rapper call a woman by a female dog's name. I'm not gonna debate it because the FCC rules and regulations would not allow it. 40 years ago, you would not read foul language. Haven't you been surprised when you turn on the radio and you hear disc jockeys using profanity? Even Steve Harvey, who's the up and coming quintessential rising star, you know, of Afro-American citizens, uses profanity on the Family Feud show. <laughs> Supposed to be a family program. And he's up there using profanity. We're not shocked by that. We've been desensitized to it. So it doesn't bother us to walk into a place where there's mechanical instruments of music. We don't necessarily grow, go along with it, but it's not going to make you stumble. You can get through it. But does the Bible teach it? And by the way, I didn't want to make this an uh, argument about that. You can go any place you want to with this, but I'm going to tell you where you're going to end up when you get finished. You will never open the New Testament Bible and show me a church that used it. Amen. Amen. That you won't do. You're going to have to decipher and, right. and, and do a whole bunch of other things. Amen. Now, to do that, you're going to have to close the Bible and go to what's called external evidences. Now, I'll go to external evidences and I'll show you through the antiquities works of Flavius Josephus or you know, I'll show you in some other you know, uh, work or uh, some extraordinary uh, source that this maybe could have possibly, maybe at some point in time, might have... But you'll never be able to open the Holy Bible. Right. And show me from Acts 2 when the church was established where the church ever used mechanical instruments. You, you say what you want to about women preaching or women officiating over the Lord's table or women passing communion trays or women doing whatever in the public assembly. You will never ever open the Bible and show me an example of a woman doing those things from Acts chapter 2 all the way to the end of the Bible. You just won't do it. And the reason why you won't do it is because it's not there. Right. It's not there. And what I'm saying to you, gentlemen, is why are we compelled to fight for something we know obviously is not there? What is our motivation for that? We're trying to conform. I don't care what the feminist movement has done to the tone of America. We are not just Americans. We are Christians. Right. Amen. 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 Gentlemen, I'm going to close out right there so we can, uh, we can play golf uh, a little bit early. <laughs> and, uh, I'm getting, oh, wait a minute. Let me say this to you. Um, I grabbed some stuff running out of my office, getting ready to go to the airport, and uh, you all probably didn't hear the story. Well, I'm not going to tell that story. Um, I noticed when I got here, I wanted to bring you some material on the new hermeneutic. And uh, what I ended up brought, bringing you was an early on draft that I did. It wasn't the final hard copy, and you got some pages missing from. I didn't grab it all, okay? And I grabbed a rough draft. So you're going to find some typographical errors. I know that many of you are probably sitting there going, well, you know, this guy's supposed to have all this education and carrying on, and, you know, but he misspelled this word. <laughs> hey, man, folks are good for that kind of thing. Don't worry about it. I know you. I preach for your cousins in, in New York. I know how you are, our church folk are. Uh, so I want to apologize for that. This was an early on rough, and there are some pages missing. But I want to thank the men who went and got this ran off. I did want to put it into your hands. Notice that there are five pillars of the new hermeneutic. And this is the very heart and core of their mentality and thinking. Number one, their hermeneutic goes like this. And if, listen, gentlemen, I want everybody to look at me. For one second, please. If you listen to people talk, <coughs> when I listen to people talk, I start getting a real good general idea of the stuff that they've been reading. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> After I listen to them talk for a few moments, and there's usually an identifiable camp of writers that produce this kind of material, or that kind of material. And so after a, while, a few years, your ears become tuned. You know, I kind of know when I hear John MacArthur. You, you know, I kind of know when I hear it. Um, and by the way, John MacArthur is, is, is quite, a, quite a, uh, uh, a writer and a, uh, what am I wanting to call him, a biblical exegete in his own right, but he is a rank premillennialist. 
He's a rank premillennialist. And I, I've read probably a lot of stuff written, written by him. Be careful is, is all I'm saying. Okay. Um, listen to people talking, you'll hear this. First pillar of the hermeneutics. Let's stop looking at the Bible as a book of laws. It should be treated as letters of love. That's what the new hermeneutic implies. Stop looking at them as the Bible as it is a book of hardcore rigid laws. It's a book of love letters. Oh, this is love, 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 love. Kissy, kissy, huggy, huggy. Mushy, mushy love. I don't know, man. I, I have a different understanding of the Bible doctrine of love. I have a different understanding than some of the foolishness I'm hearing. And I'm not talking about here, but I'm talking about in our brotherhood in, in the country today about love. You know, if I love you, brother, I'll tell you the truth. And if I love the Lord, I'll do whatever it is he told me to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Is, is that right? And by the way, my commandments are not grievous, is what the Lord said to us. So that, you know, I, my, my antennas kind of go up. You know, when, I, when I'm around preachers and in conversations, and I start hearing people talking, well, okay, I know what you've been reading. I know what you've been reading after. If you, here's the point, gentlemen, don't miss the point. If we can somehow abandon pattern authority, and the notion that there are patterns that are authoritative, and we start looking at the Bible as a book of love letters, then you can do anything. You can have women preachers. There's no law to condemn it. You can have mechanical instruments of music. There is no law to condemn it. It never was. The Bible never, the, the books were never a point. The point never was law. Just love letters to set boundaries and perimeters for our love relationship in Jesus. And the fact that he died for us because he loved us. And he did. And we should regard that. But that's sheer insanity to think that that is the sum total of it. The sum total. If you love me, you obey my commandments. That's what he said. John 15, 14. That's what he said. Number two. Uh, what does number two say, brother? Uh, the rejection of the concept that the law of exclusion or silence is also now, brethren, you have to understand, I wrote this in 2002, and I'd like to consider myself a pretty, uh, well, how can I put this? I'd like to consider myself a, a fairly conservative guy. This notion, you have to be careful with this. This is what I'm saying, you have to be careful with this. The notion that whatever is not explicitly stated is implicitly forbidden. You have to be careful. Yeah, and I wrote that, and I'm going to rewrite it, Don, because I don't like the way I worded that, uh, and I have a different understanding of it. We all grow. Amen? Amen? The notion that which is not explicitly stated is implicitly forbidden. That knocks out a lot of stuff, doesn't it? You better get rid of your church building. It's not explicitly stated. Song books, song leaders, ushers, <laughs> they're not explicitly stated. Amen. Don? The best way, uh, maybe not the best way, but a recommended way of understanding the law of silence is when it is pertaining to a subject matter. So what is not stated regarding a particular subject, not just whatever is not stated, then that's what I receive and say, okay, that must be implicitly rejected. <coughs> we don't do that in anything. Right, we right. We don't do that in anything. We don't do that in our personal lives. We don't do that in our work lives. We don't do that. But when I'm studying a subject and I begin to take into consideration that God may be yelling something through his silence, the law of silence is going to begin to help me identify what God is not saying as much as what he is saying. Right. 
Gentlemen, one of the biggest things I've gotten out of this kind of study is what it helps me do more often. I may go away not always knowing what a scripture teaches. After going through all of this, I may often go away not knowing exactly, definitively what a text teaches. What this process does for me is it sets boundaries. I can know where it was going too far. Based on historical context, immediate, remote, ultimate context, cultural context, linguistic context, parallel context, going through the circle of context, looking at authorial intent, uh, do, doing, doing what is called looking at uh, the, the canonical context, uh, I can determine the boundaries and I can know what's stepping over the line. See, I don't have to know what a thing is to know what it's not. Does that make sense? I don't always have to know what a thing is to know what it's not. I may not, I may not know what this is. I know it ain't an automobile. I don't have to know what it is to know what it's not. And if I have tools to set boundaries and perimeters, then it can help me not get out in left field. Because I'm going to tell you something, brethren. My experience has been nine times out of ten, when we get out there, it's hard to bring you back. It is. It's been my experience. Most times when brethren get out there, the likelihood of you reeling them in and bringing them back to doing sensible Bible study is null and void. Amen. It's a hard thing. That's why James says this. Yeah, he does. And he yeah. said, he does. He does. Yes, sir. And then I'm going to start winding it down. Okay. okay. Can we simply, uh, do we simply say, when God tells you what to do, I'm careful with that because that is very closely associated to that which is not explicitly stated as the implicitly forbidden. Because God never told us to get a church building. He never told and, and, and it's, it's scriptural to have one. Believe me. What I was referring to was uh, instrumental music. If he tell you to sing, if he tell you to sing, that's my point. He said the Bible tells us what to do. To sing. Yeah. I was taught that argument, and I think that that's a good argument. I don't think it's the best argument. I was taught that, right from the, that argument, from the beginning. You know, when God tells you what to do, you don't have to do it. If God sends you to the store, tell you to get a pack of cookies, he, you don't have to have enough sense no, not to come back with sugar and milk and butter and, you know, good. You know, that kind of thing. That's, that's logic. That's logic, and it's, I, think it's, I think it has validity to it. I really do. I think it has validity to it. I don't think it's the strongest argument think that the strongest argument is to let the Bible speak for itself. You think God can't say what he wants? Matthew chapter 28 and verse 30, after they took the Lord's Supper, they went out to the Mount of Olives and they sung a hymn. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, what is it? I will pray with the spirit, I will pray with the understanding, I will sing with the spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart unto the Lord. James, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. James chapter 5 and verse number 13, what is it then? I will pray with the, um, um, what is, uh, what is it, uh, James chapter uh, Five in verse number thirteen. Is, is it, yeah yeah is 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 any any uh boy John, Don you're really stuck on this New American Standard aren't you? <laughs> That's a quote from New American Standard. It's it's. Um, <laughs> yes, any afflicted let him let him praise. Any among you merry let him sing psalms. Now, now I don't want to be guilty of the very very proof text example. Would you? Give me some intelligent explanation as why the Bible repetitiously and redundantly and excessively keeps talking about sing, 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 sing. How do you explain that away? And by the way, Pasalo is not the only argument that's used. I'm aware of the fact that Pasalo uh, singing, Ephesians chapter 5, 9, speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. I, I, I realize that that word is pasalo. 
lexicographers say that the word pasalo means to pluck and to twang. But here's an example of understanding linguistic context and words that modify the definition of other words because in that verse, uh, sing is modified by in your heart. So I know what I'm to pluck and to twang. Look at the verse, it's staring you right there in the face. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart. What modifies pasalo is in your heart because I'm told what I am to pluck and to twang. I'm to pluck and to twang the heart. However, pasalo is not, and by the way, well, I'll come to that later. Pasalo is not the only word used. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16, the word singing is not pasalo. It's the Greek word abdo. Singing with grace in your heart unto the Lord. The word abdo means to act intransitly. To act intransitly means without the use of a direct object. Are y'all out there? Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17. It's, it's ado, it's not pasalo. And it means to act without the use of a direct object. Gentlemen, there are two, hermeneutically speaking, there are two kinds of commands. Generic and specific. Other than positive and negative divide. A generic command is when God does not specify a generic command, by example, would be Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, and lo, I'll be with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Bible commands us to go. Does he specify how? Can I go by car? Plane? Bus? Train? Skateboard? God doesn't specify. It's a generic command. Ephesians 5.19 is a specific command. Amen. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, if he'd have put a period right there, I'd have went, go get an instrument. And by the way, you're talking to a, a music major. I love music. There ain't a man in this room love music more than I do. I spent a significant portion of my life in the performing arts. Have you not heard me say no less than twice that I spent a significant number of years at Inlock and Arts Academy, 1973, went and performed on the Montreux Jazz Festival in Montreux, Switzerland. After Montreux, Switzerland, came back to the United States, began to tour and to uh, perform professionally until I decided that that kind of life was not for me. I wanted to be a daddy, I wanted a wife, and I couldn't do it traveling all over, so I settled down, got a job, went to General Motors, and started building trucks. Amen. God, God took it from there. And God took it from there. Yes. So I love music. You're talking to a man, I love music, man. In my home, I have a considerable number of instruments. And I play them in my spare time. That's got nothing to do with what God requires.